You can get much further with a kind word and a gun than you can with a kind word alone. Al Capone. I'm gonna make him an offer again with you. So as a student of fashion, I find it interesting that one of the most violent criminal organizations known to man has seemed to have produced so many style icons. Seriously, anytime we do a poll on style icons, who are the best dressed men in history, whether fiction or nonfiction, we get characters like Michael Corleone of The Godfather, Sam Ace Rothstein in Casino, Charlie Lucky Luciano in Boardwalk Empire. Now, of course, these aren't real people. These are Hollywood actors playing a part, right? Well, not exactly, because if you know your history, you'll know that all of these characters are based off of well-dressed mafiosos. I mean, just look at the classic style of Frank Costello. This guy picked up many times in the media, always had an impeccable look. And in real life, when he was alive, Charles Luciano was a dapper dog. This guy loved style and flashy things. Bugsy Siegel, Al Capone, John Gotti. All of these guys were known to have an impeccable look, a style, an image that, yeah, anytime they were in the paper, they looked good. So how did this come about? How did a criminal syndicate that was involved with smuggling, drug dealing, prostitution, trafficking, even murder, all of a sudden come synonymous with men's style? Well, in today's video, gents, we're going to answer that question first by talking about the history of the mafia. Next up, we're going to talk about the individual styles of a number of the mafiosos. And finally, we're going to talk about the rise of the mafia style in pop culture. And at the end of this video, I'll wrap things up by giving you my personal opinion based off of my time as a custom clothier because we designed quite a few wardrobes and number of them actually being mafioso inspired. I'm going to give you my personal opinion of why I think men in the mafia cared so much about their image. Part one, the origins of the mafia. So nowadays in Western culture and media, we see the word mafia just thrown around. Any criminal organization, big group of a gang, we call a mafia. You oftentimes see it associated with ethnicities. So you see Russian mafia, Chinese mafia, but all of those are wrong. The true definition of the word mafia actually comes from a criminal syndicate that originated in the Middle Ages in Italy, specifically Sicily. Now the word comes from the Italian noun mafioso, which roughly translates to meaning bravado, swagger, arrogance, but also fearlessness and pride. Why do we have organized crime to begin with? Well, if you know your economics history, back in about 1812, you had 2,000 total landowners in Italy. Fast forward about 50 years, all of a sudden you had 20,000 landowners because there was a big economic shift going on in the country. You had a lot of violence, a lot of, let's just say that it was pretty shady and people realized very quickly that you needed to have somebody protect yourself, your family and your land if you wanted to keep it. Now, if any of you guys know Sicilians, they are very resistant to Italian rule and they were kind of doing their own things and they were definitely having some economic turmoil. You had tons of people without money starving and they were going and they were taking whatever they could from, let's say, some of these rich landowners. And the landowners realized, you know what? We need to have some type of organized groups of men that are armed and are going to protect what's ours. But specifically in Italy, something interesting happened. These armed men, these thugs uh, that were protecting the landowners realized, you know what? We can actually charge the landowners a lot, especially if we come together and we organize ourselves. And all of a sudden, we can be the middlemen that are offering protection to everybody and we can get a really nice cut of the pie. And that right there is the genesis of the protection racket that we would see for over a hundred years, the mafia using to basically extort money from all types of businesses and people. But what does this have to do with the United States? How did the mafia get over here? Well, we have immigration to thank for that and the fact that when immigrants came over to the United States, especially in the late 19th century, they were not treated very well. You would show up to New York and you would find out, hey, there's a job here, but it's only for a Protestant, for someone that is white. 
and Italians were not considered white. Also, you've got the Irish who were looked down upon. You've got the Jews that were ostracized. Basically, people found themselves in the lower parts of New York getting thrown in the really bad housing. People were trying to survive and they realized, you know what, some of these old techniques being used in the old world, we can, yeah, we can bring this over and use it here. When plunder becomes a way of life for a group of men in a society, over the course of time, they create for themselves a legal system that authorizes it and a moral code that glorifies it. Frederick Bastiat. Now, I threw in that quote from old Bastiat because I really want to highlight the fact that this wasn't just the Italians. You had all types of groups coming together and leveraging things to their advantage. The Italians, you know, just weren't strong enough to actually make it law. But you look at the politicians at the top, yeah, they were going through and creating some crazy laws that were definitely in their favor so that they could exploit the people. Now, during the 1880s, 1890s, a lot of large cities, especially New York, had a huge gang problem. And you can actually see this talked about in The Gangs of New York, great movie, even a better book. And so, for the next 20 to 30 years in New York City, you had a variety of different groups popping up, fighting. Now, for those of you guys outside the United States, you probably have observed that us Americans, we are all over the place. We say one thing, but then we do another, and we even pass laws that we're not going to follow. And that's what happened in 1919, the 18th Amendment. And it had all great things going forward. I mean, the women that were pushing for it, and it was at the time a lot of women, because they were tired of being abused by their spouses. They, you know, associated alcohol with the devil. You saw right here a law being passed that could be exploited. People still wanted to drink. And that's what the mafia, the organized crime jumped right on. They were very good at this, about immediately making it available for those people willing to purchase. And those people were the majority of Americans. So, the Roaring Twenties, this was the golden age for the mafia. And whenever it stepped out of the shadows into the limelight, and people were receptive. People were open because these guys had taken over and they were delivering what the majority of Americans wanted, a cold drink of alcohol. They didn't agree with that law and all of a sudden you had these this Robin Hood coming out and making things happen because they had networks. They had ways of skirting around. They had their own distribution. And all of a sudden you started seeing these this criminal organization in a sense for many people to become almost legitimate. And most importantly, for the guys in charge of these criminal organizations, they saw it as the chance to finally come out of the shadows and look legitimate. They were actually out there hiring lawyers, hiring accountants, all of these people that were legitimate people that now worked for them. They viewed themselves as businessmen and as such, they started dressing like the fashionable businessmen and successful businessmen they felt themselves to be. Now, of course, there's a lot more to the story of the rise of the American Mafia, but at this point, we're starting to see some of the men come to the limelight. Let's highlight some of the styles and looks of these famous mobsters in the 1920s and 30s. First up on this list of stylish mobsters, we've got the guy that is credited in many ways with starting it all known as the brain, the big bankroll, the man uptown, and the fixer. I'm talking about Arnold Rothstein. Yeah, this is the guy that fixed the 1919 World Series between the Chicago White Sox and the Cincinnati Reds. And on top of being an impeccable dresser, he was also the mentor of Lucky Luciano, Meyer Lansky, Frank Costello, and numerous other future crime bosses. And that matters a lot because apparently a lot of his mannerisms, his way of dress, his pressing on the importance of setting an image and in a sense in the public's eye, being able to look like you at least follow some laws was passed on to all of his, all the men that he mentored who went on to follow in his footsteps. Now, as you can tell from his name, he wasn't Italian. He came from a wealthy Jewish family. In fact, his background, very different than a lot of the people he was around. But this gave him an advantage. He had a solid education, although he never really liked school, but he loved gambling and he had an eye for spotting opportunity. I mean, seriously, if you read this guy's biography, he saw the bigger picture and he controlled coming in from Canada 
the booze. So he made sure, hey, I have the distribution with this coming across. He had investments in a number of the speakeasies, so he owned parts of those. In addition, he had alcohol actually coming across the Atlantic Ocean, high-end alcohol, which he knew would be in favor and he'd be able to charge a premium for. Now, he was also a compulsive gambler and unfortunately, it led to his untimely death when he owed, uh, I think it was a few hundred thousand dollars, which nowadays would equate to about five million dollars that he lost in some uh, gambling debts and uh, he didn't pay it and apparently somebody took that personally and he was shot. Next up, we have Lucky Luciano, not the largest guy, but his image, his style, basically he was talked about. When this guy was walking down the street, people thought he was an A-list celebrity. People usually only owned one, maybe two good suits. Somebody like Lucky Luciano though, this guy was sporting all different types of patterns. He had a suit for every day, not of the month, of the year. The guy just had a huge wardrobe. He brought in tons of fun hats. He was basically, nowadays you would say there almost definitely he was a peacock. He's out there wearing pieces, wearing expensive clothing, and it was one of the quickest and easiest ways when you're walking around the city to be able to send that message, I am a man to be reckoned with. Next up, let's talk about Frank Costello. This was an interesting character because he was actually, in a sense, smoothing things out with a lot of the legitimate people. So, politicians, businessmen, city officials, this was his expertise. And a lot of the people he worked with, let's just say that he greased the roads, he threw out bribes. This guy made things happen and made sure that there weren't any problems, there weren't any issues. So, a lot of his style, you know, his image was a bit more muted than Lucky's, but it was still incredibly effective. He wasn't afraid to throw in that pocket square to look great with a hat. This was a guy for, you know, his entire life always looked on point. And let's not forget about Al Capone, AKA Scarface, the original. So what you've got to love about Al Capone is this was, was a heavier guy, bigger guy, obviously had a big scar on his face, what he was known for, but he always wanted to get his best side. So even when photographers would come take pictures of Al, he was always dressed to the nines. In addition, he would give them specific instructions about how to take a great looking photo of him. The right side, the right image, it was very important. He always had his gray suits, he had his gold watch, he had particular looks, hats that he knew just made him look better, even slimmed up that silhouette. He understood the power of image and style. And speaking of knowing how to dress, let's talk about Bugsy Siegel. This is perhaps the most handsome mobster that ever existed. Just ask the ladies. Maybe it was just his jaw structure. Maybe it was the way that he wore the clothing. I mean, he wore loud, flamboyant clothing. Every image you see of this guy, it is sharp, on point. I mean, he could have had a career in Hollywood. He decided though, and it was from what I hear and you know, what I read, a very violent person. So he decided, you know, hey, I'm gonna go the whole mobster route. But when it comes to image, when it comes to presentation, and when it comes to luck with the ladies, yeah, nobody held a candle to Bugsy. Do you believe that there were any stylish mafia? Can you even consider people that were in the mafia stylish? Agree? Disagree? I want to hear your opinions below. Now, some of you guys may be thinking, okay, they looked good, they had some style, they popped up in a number of newspapers, maybe even a few movies. I think in the 1930s, we had Scarface, we had Little Caesar. But how did they go from that to becoming style icons? Well, a number of things, again, went into the mafia's favor. So, we saw, you know, prohibition go away. All of a sudden, alcohol was made legal. This could have been the end of everything. But a big thing happened in the 1940s, World War II. And all of a sudden, we saw a majority of the men in law enforcement and other capable young men being sent overseas for combat. Now, what opportunity here for the mafia and they took full advantage of being able to have protection rings set up definitely in the garment industry, other areas throughout uh, different cities and you saw them actually get a stranglehold, even a deeper control. Um, you know, in, in, again, this is a time of rationing but they realized, hey, there are people that, you know, we can create counterfeits of some of these rationing cards. We can go through and we can find ways to actually make money on this. So, they spent World War II, the 1950s, getting stronger, organizing themselves and by the 1960s, we see organized crime at the height of its power. In fact, during the 1970s, it was said that 26 families throughout the United States controlled organized crime and none were bigger than the five families out of New York. 
Now, the top family and definitely the most famous because of one single individual was the Gambino family. And that's because of a guy named John Gotti. Now, John Gotti was a former Gambino captain that was well known for ruling with an iron fist and for being incredibly stylish. He was also known as Dapper Don. Now, Gotti was featured all over the place. Again, always wearing suits that cost thousands of dollars details in his accessories from the pocket squares to anything, his jewelry, everything that he wore was spot on, was expensive and in a sense was screaming, I've got power, I've got money and you can't do anything about it. And this is where life starts to imitate art. All of a sudden we saw the height, the mafia at its power pinnacle and Hollywood jumps in. We saw the book, Mario Puzo's The Godfather and subsequent Godfather 1, 2 and 3. It's just reinforcing this image, this belief, this look that if you're going to be a boss in a mafia, you're going to be organized crime. You are going to look good stealing whatever it is you're taking. I mean, if you ever watched the movie Goodfellas, even though Joe Pesci, you know, you're almost laughing at the guy. You have to admit, yes, I hate, I mean, those collars right there, those shirt collars, actually I had a guy commission to have a shirt collar made exactly like this. I never thought it was stylish, but I get it. It was a unique look. You all of a sudden start to realize that you can't buy a lot of this clothing. These guys are getting everything custom made. Their suits, their shirts, the trousers, those shoes are cost thousands of dollars. Those watches are thousand dollar watches. The Godfather movies, part one, part two, I especially liked part two. I mean, they go back and you see the flashes to you know, going back to Italy, the way that they dressed there when they were visiting back the old country, you know, the initial boss that uh, Vito Corleone goes ahead and offs because yeah, he uh, needs to get him out of the way, but still that guy, white suit had style and you can bet that this had an effect on the people who in a sense, their lives were being glorified by Hollywood and they were starting to live up and you had life imitating art art copying life and it was just this circle that all of a sudden started creating in our pop culture. So now my opinion as a style expert, as a guy that's designed thousands of wardrobes and just made custom clothing for years, what do I think? Why are the mafia, why are they considered so stylish? And the answer is because they were stylish and they probably still are stylish. Whenever I look at their style, their image, the way that they put things together, these are men that actually paid attention to style and enjoyed it. I think it was highlighted by a recent interview I saw. There was a gentleman, uh, I think it's John Elite and Gene Barello. This is just a couple years ago and these guys are casually talking about image and style and why it matters to them. And these guys are apparently both inside. I don't know their full story, but they just talked about, hey, when you start to make it, one of the first things you do is you splurge a bit on your clothing. And there's certain things in certain groups that they obsess about sunglasses, watches. One guy even went in, he was frank to say, you know what? I had robbed a few watch stores, so I had quite a few watches and I really got into them. I mean, they're straight up like that. All these guys came from situations of not having a whole lot of means. Their view of success was maybe these people that they saw on television, they saw in media, they saw in newspapers, they saw in magazines who looked successful and their idea of looking successful was a suit was having that business type of look. So they copied that, they imitated it, they added a bit to it, they made it theirs. It became also a mark of being part of the club. Again, if you're in this group and everyone's in the sunglasses, everyone has the latest Gucci sunglasses, then yeah, you're going to wear this and you're going to wear them everywhere and it's going to be an identifier. It's going to be marking you and marking the tribe that you're a part of. The next reason so many of us find the mafia stylish is because we identify with them. Whether you want to admit it or not, when you see an underdog, a marginalized group, and if you come from that type of background, no matter what, you, and we've all at some point in our lives probably been marginalized. Maybe at school you were picked on. Maybe you were part of an ethnic group that wasn't, you know, really seen favorably. Maybe you have legitimately dealt with racism. You know what? When you watch a movie and you see somebody that is like you, that is just tired of dealing with this crap and they go out there and they take what they perceive to be theirs. There's something in a lot of us, this, uh, this feeling that, you know what? I, I fantasize about doing that. 
Seriously, have you ever watched the movie American Gangster? The way Denzel Washington brings that character to life, the way that he moves, the confidence that he has whenever he sees somebody that owes him money, takes the sugar, pours it out and goes right and says, hey, you owe me money, put it right in here. And whenever he is not paid and how many of us have not been paid money we're owed, he just simply takes out his gun and takes care of business. And whether you like it or not, all of a sudden you didn't expect that to come from a man that was just having a meeting that is dressed to the nines, looks the way he does, but realizes, you know, it's like, hey, sometimes you got to be savage to get what you want. The reality is Hollywood has painted a very nice picture of the mafia in the media. And we've got these amazing actors with unforgettable quotes in impeccable clothing taken with cameras and shots and angles that just make them look magnificent. And when we see this and it's played to us again and again, and we're so far, we're so distant from actually having endured or engaged with the real thing, it is something that is very easy for us to idealize and for us to look at these guys as style icons. And gents, if you enjoyed today's video, you're going to absolutely love this one. Were the Nazis stylish? I get into the details. I break out and I talk about a topic that many of you guys actually asked me. It was, why are those SS uniforms looking so good? I don't want to like them, but I do. Where well, there's a lot of history to it. There's a lot of very interesting facts about the Nazi uniform, which I break out in this video. This is easily one of my best videos on the channel.